Coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll introduce you to NCBA's new president and hear what he expects for the year ahead. Plus, how are the cattle markets shaping up this year? We'll have an update from Cattle Facts. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Hi everybody and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Russell Nimitz. Well, if this was a normal year, we'd be wrapping up another cattle industry convention and NCBA trade show about now, but the last 12 months have been anything but normal. Although the convention has been moved to August, there was some very important business that couldn't wait another six months. Now, even in these unusual times, governance and policy work must go on, and the election and transition of officers, development of policy, and checkoff planning work had to continue for the good of the industry. So to make that happen, NCBA held virtual meetings the first week in February. During the week, NCBA's seven policy committees met along with NCBA's executive committee and the meeting concluded with NCBA's Board of Directors approving policy and installing a new officer team to lead the organization in 2021. NCBA officers are vital to the success of the organization, and these men and women are cattle producers from across the country who volunteer their time to serve all segments of the beef industry. Jerry Bone, a Kansas farmer and cattle feeder will lead these efforts in 2021 as NCBA's next president. Let's go ahead and take a look at Jerry's long and distinguished career in the beef industry. Pratt Feeders in Central Kansas is a place and a business Jerry Bone knows well. A Kansas native, Jerry started his career as an assistant feed yard manager and then moved to Colorado to work with Cattle Facts for seven years before moving back to manage this feed yard. Came here in 1982, August of 1982, and as a feed yard manager, uh, when I got here we had about 15,000 cattle on feed and over the years we were able to uh, grow this facility to where it holds about 40,000 today and and then in uh, 1989 we bought uh, Ashland feeders at Ashland Kansas in 1995 we bought Buffalo feeders Buffalo Oklahoma we currently have the, the three main feed yards with a total capacity of about 85 to 90,000 head the focus here at Pratt feeders for the most part has been to be a custom feed yard where we feed cattle for other people Today, about 75 to 80 percent of the cattle on feed here are owned by rancher customers from various states around the country, and we uh, focus really hard on being uh, customer oriented. Uh, we've gone to an individual animal management uh, system where every uh, animal is managed to its uh, ideal endpoint, and I think customers benefit from that, and profitability is improved because of that process. While the cattle are impressive, the feed yard facility itself is too. It's unique because it was built on the site of a decommissioned World War II Army airfield. During the war, uh, the government built this air base and the B-29 crews were trained here before they went overseas to the war. And right where I'm standing right now is the middle of one of the runways. Uh, this one's about a mile and a half long from the east or from the west to the east and and uh, we have we have cattle alleys on both sides of this runway and it's worked out quite well for our operation though jerry is retired from day-to-day -day management here he is a part owner of pratt feeders and remains on the board he owns cattle and continues to manage farm ground the company operates he's proud of how pratt feeders has grown and even more proud of how the beef industry has improved over the years I think the industry's done a very fantastic job of uh, genetic improvement. When I started my career here, uh, if we had a 50 or 55 percent choice in prime grade, we were really excited about it. Today, the industry's averaging on top of 80 percent choice. Carcass weights have probably gone from six to seven hundred pound average to more like eight to nine hundred or maybe even a thousand pound average. 
A past president of the Kansas Livestock Association, Jerry has served in a variety of NCBA leadership roles. And as he takes the reins as the 2021 president of NCBA, he sees both challenges and opportunities for the beef cattle industry. I think some of the opportunities that we see as we look forward here into 2021 and beyond is certainly beef demand has jumped up here. Uh, that's been a shining star even during the COVID pandemic. Uh, I think people are spending more time at home. They're learning to cook beef again. The beef product and quality is the best it's ever been. So I think that's certainly an opportunity. We think also the opportunity to grow our, our export market. I think uh, even though the Chinese and us have some road bumps, their demand for uh, high quality beef is going to grow. Certainly that's an opportunity as we go forward. I think some other issues that we're going to have to work on is uh, sustainability and the consumer's concern about uh, how animals are raised, uh, animal welfare, the environmental impact that our beef industry has on the environment. I think the fact that the beef animal is an upcycler, that we take grass and rough feed and uh, the majority of the life is spent eating products that are not edible by people and turning it into high quality protein will certainly be at the forefront. Though he prefers to spend his time around pens of cattle, Jerry knows it's critical for cattlemen and women to have a strong voice working on their behalf in Washington, D.C. NCBA has a lobbying team in Washington, D.C. that works every day interacting with government officials, senators, congressmen, and their staff to uh, establish uh, positive regulations and positive environment, business environment for the beef industry. And so while we're out here feeding cattle and taking care of them and farming and doing all the things that it does to, to support these, these animals that we care for, we have a team in Washington that's working on our behalf, making certain that the government regulation and laws that get passed will not hamper our industry and then hopefully will uh, pass laws that are beneficial to us. Uh, for instance, opening up more uh, export markets uh, uh, around the world will certainly be a beneficial thing that can, can happen there. Building unity is a priority for Jerry, who wants to see state cattle organizations and NCBA pull together to create more opportunity for producers in all sectors of the American beef cattle business. The state associations in the beef industry are, you know, obviously they're a very important partner to the to NCBA, uh, but that's where the rubber meets the road. They're the ones that are in contact with the individual cattlemen on a daily basis. Uh, uh, and it, it's important to NCBA that we develop a very strong, positive relationship with every state affiliate. And, and I know that's one of the goals that we have going forward is, is looking at those relationships and how we can forge an even stronger bond between the state and national organizations as we uh, work to protect the industry from government regulation, uh, as we grow our uh, positive impact on the environment. NCBA is working on a daily basis at, for the benefit of every member and in fact we're working on the benefit for those who have chosen not to join us too and so as we talk about uh, membership first of all uh, being a member of NCBA is important. Without that membership we can't do the work that we do. The local member is uh, vastly important to us and so we we spend a lot of time working to help them be profitable and successful and, and in turn if they do that we're going to be successful as a national organization. I am very excited to have the opportunity to be the president of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. I consider it kind of a crowning event for my career in the business. And joining us now is Jerry Bone. And Jerry, tell us your feelings as you begin your time as president of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Well, good afternoon, Russell, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to visit with you. Uh, you know, as you start thinking about taking the leadership of this great industry and this organization, uh, it's exciting, and at the same time, it's a little bit humbling. Uh, but we have lots of uh, opportunities, I think, in the year ahead to work with the new administration. Uh, at the same time, it's a little bit sad today. Today's the day that we would have been in starting our national convention in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we had to postpone that and push it back to later in the year. And then we had additional plans to uh, go to Fort Worth, Texas this week and have a smaller gathering of industry leaders and committee people to uh, do some of the association work. And unfortunately, with the COVID-19 pandemic rearing its head again, we had to also cancel that. So now we have 
reverted back to what many of us have been doing all year, uh, communicating virtually and having our meetings virtually. So, so I'm sad from that standpoint, but I think, uh, you know, the association continues to operate really well and accomplish things despite the, the challenges that we've been presented with here in the past year. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what are some of the opportunities that you see ahead this year for NCBA members and the beef cattle industry? Well, I think obviously that, you know, the first priority that we always have is making sure that we have a and maintain a business climate to where producers can be profitable. And, you know, there's many facets to that and many things that impact that. Uh, obviously, cattle markets and prices are top of mind for most of our producers all of the time. And I think one of the bright things is beef demand has been really good this year. Uh, uh, you know, we've had to kind of revamp from uh, focusing on uh, a, sp a split between hotel, restaurant, and institutional marketing and retail marketing to primarily retail marketing. And it's our hope here in 2021 that uh, some of these restaurants will reopen and the HRI business can get developed again. I think one other bright spot is that beef exports have been really, really good here for several months now. And so that should bode well for us, uh, particularly as we get our uh, supply of cattle back more in line with packing capacity as we go into 2021. And I think with the, with the new administration this year, uh, their focus on the environment and sustainability certainly brings that to the forefront. And, you know, uh, we cattlemen are the, are the original environmentalists anyway. Uh, we've been taking care of lands for hundreds of years. And so I think one of the challenges we face is that we've got to change the narrative and make certain that we're part of the solution and that we point out the positive things that our industry is already doing. You know, uh, uh, we operate and manage millions of acres of land that sequester carbon. That's certainly something that I think the, the uh, Congress and the regulators need to pay attention to as we move forward in this debate. Uh, our animals an upcycler, you know, it uses grass and forages and crop residue and things that are not useful for human consumption to uh, uh, grow uh, and, and produce a really high quality protein product. So uh, that along with uh, the normal things in Washington, uh, you know, regulations, uh, uh, working with Congress on uh, keeping things uh, in line that don't hurt our industry. Um, you know, another, I think one other topic that comes to mind is uh, a viable uh, animal traceability program. I think we've got to continue to make progress in developing that uh, for animal disease traceability so that, heaven forbid, if we have another uh, outbreak here, that we're able to manage that efficiently. So those are two or three things that come to mind right at the top of the head, uh, Russell. And finally, Jerry, what would you ask of your fellow cattle producers out there in the year ahead? Well, I think we have to all cooperate and work together. Uh, you know, we've all had this COVID challenge, and I think recovering from that certainly uh, will be an important thing that all of us have to be a part of. Uh, I think working uh, uh, to uh, gr continue to uh, grow high quality beef for consumers, uh, managing the land, uh, you know, certainly our ranchers in the western part of the country have lots of issues with uh, uh, government regulation in the public land, so we have to continue to monitor that. But uh, uh, I, I think, again, uh, looking for the, br the bright things that our industry has to offer uh, and uh, Negotiating with a new administration will certainly be something that I think uh, will be a challenge for all of us that we need to all band together to uh, make certain that uh, the impact of, of their regulation and the things they want to do is not harmful to our industry and that we can make it a positive. Well, Jerry, we certainly look forward to touching base with you again soon here on Cattlemen to Cattlemen. But in the meantime, we certainly thank you for your time and, of course, your service to the industry. Thank you, Russell, good to be with you. Still ahead on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll introduce you to the new president-elect of NCBA and hear his thoughts for what the year ahead holds. So stay with us, we'll be right back. It's time to register for the 2021 Cattle Industry Convention Winter Reboot Virtual Event, February 23rd and 24th. Reconnect, reinvent, and reimagine all the ways you can engage with top industry experts and vendors virtually from anywhere. The Winter Reboot is a jam-packed two-day virtual event consisting of education programs, a Washington, D.C. issues update, Cattle Facts Outlook session, Tech Tools preview, and a sneak peek at what to expect during the 2021 Cattlemen's College. 
This is a great way to reset in 2021 and prepare for the upcoming in-person cattle industry convention and NCBA trade show August 10th through 12th in Nashville, Tennessee. Dial in to convention.ncba.org for all the details and to get registered today. And welcome back to Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Well, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association is very proud to be a producer-driven organization. And cattlemen and cattlewomen in every segment of the industry and state help to set the policy and direction for the association. And it's those same cattlemen and women that volunteer their time to serve in leadership roles at NCBA. Now, NCBA's new president-elect has a long history of beef industry service. Don Schiefelbein, who along with his father, seven brothers, and three nephews, operates a diversified farming operation in Kimball, Minnesota, will serve the NCBA as its 2021 president-elect. And joining us now is Don Schiefelbein. And first things first, Don, congratulations on becoming president-elect of the NCBA. And with that said, what are some of those key outcomes of the NCBA's board meeting you wrapped up this week? Well, it was a very unusual board meeting, as you can imagine, with all the virtual attendees and no in-face uh, discussions. But as always, we had a lot of meat to discuss. And of course, top of mind right now was trying to get our arms around price discovery and getting these markets in the shape that we need to get them into. As you know, Russell, that uh, we put together a working group to try and look at that. And they kind of reported on their findings. And when I say working group, Russell, they met 30 times since we met last. So they've They've been really rolling up their sleeves and trying to get around this whole idea of how can we get more negotiated trade, firstly, and secondly, how do we get more packer participation in every region? And I think they've come up with a solution, so hopefully we can move forward and do some tests and make sure we're getting that robust price discovery that all the cattle producers want. Well, absolutely. The two most important things to farmers and ranchers are weather and markets still. So give us some additional details on the policy priorities for NCBA in the year ahead. Well, you know, with the whole new administration, you kind of have to adjust yourselves for what they're looking at as well. And of course, front and center, you had to be probably uh, living underneath a rock if you haven't heard the Biden administration say climate change, right? And so what we're trying to do, and I, what, what's very important for us to get off the ground early on, is this whole discussion around sustainability and make sure that we can try and make sure we adjust that discussions where, where we're part of the solution. You know, if you're a cattle producer and you live along these lands, you know how important it is to be a good steward of the land, make sure we take care of the animals in a respectful manner. And we need to make sure we get that message across to those in Washington, D.C., to make sure that when it comes to climate change, we're not the problem, by gosh, we're the solution. And I think that's a huge opportunity with this Biden administration. Well said, and before we let you off the hook today, what opportunities do you see for NCBA and the beef cattle industry and its producers here in 2021? Well, you know, I think the opportunities are immense. I think once we get our feet back on the ground within these markets, et cetera, as you know, Russell, beef demand has been incredibly good, right? And so once we turn that beef demand into a bigger share of the market uh, for beef producers, I think good things are about to happen. And I think we're just really weeks away from turning this market into a very positive event for the coming year. Well, Don, as always, we thank you for your time here on Cattlemen to Cattlemen and, of course, your service to America's beef cattle industry. Thank you. Now, to keep up to date on the progress of NCBA's policy work and to help make a difference in the industry, why not join Don as a member of NCBA? It's easy to do. Just call 1-866-233-3872 or visit the website ncba.org. And a reminder, there's a great opportunity for producer education and information coming up on February 23rd and 24th with the Cattle Industries Convention Winter Reboot. 
It's a completely virtual event that you can take part in right from the convenience and comforts of your home. There will be a Cattle Facts Market Outlook session, an update from Washington, D.C., and 10 producer education sessions that can help set you up for success here in 2021. You can get all the details, including how to register, at the website convention.ncba.org. Next up, Kevin Ochsner will check in with the experts at Cattle Facts to get the latest on how cattle and grain markets are shaping up for 2021. So stay with us. Are you ready for a better shot at profitability with a more consistent, more efficient cow herd? Then don't miss out on the maternal edge offered by GelbV and Balancer Genetics. Stability and longevity is really a strength of the GelbV breed. And you know, when these cows can remain in the herd 10 years or thereabouts, uh, they return a lot of dollars to the producers. Research shows GelbV cows will stay in your herd longer with greater fertility and more pounds of calf wean. It's the ability of that cow not only to have that calf unassisted, but to own that calf, to stay right there with that calf, to do whatever's necessary to get that calf going no matter what. No breed we work with does a better job of owning that calf and making sure that she's going to take care of the Gelfi breed. For cow-calf producers, the maternal traits offered by Gelfi and Balancer Genetics are the smart, reliable, and profitable choice. Find out more at the website gelfi.org. Join the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. NCBA is working every day to defend your interests in Washington, D.C. And there are big benefits to being a member. You'll get news you can use in the National Cattlemen and policy updates from Beltway Beef, plus big discounts from John Deere and more great partners. Join now. Call 866-233-3872 or sign up online at ncba.org. Welcome back to Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Ochsner. Having is well underway on our ranch and on ranches all across the United States now. And that begs the question, what's the market outlook for these calves being born right now? With us to tell us more about that is Dwayne Lenz from Cattle Facts. Dwayne, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Kevin. Hey, it's great to see you. We're, uh, we're happy to be here all in one place. Absolutely. Well, let's get started with this uh, recent uh, placement number that we saw out on that report. What did that number tell you and what does it mean for beef cattle producers? Yeah, Kevin, the last on feed number we had, uh, placements were up just a little bit. You know, I think I'm going to go back though. over the last three months, placements in the feed yards are down over 400,000 head. So that's a reflection of a smaller calf crop, a smaller cow herd that we have coming on. Long term, we think that's positive for prices because obviously we're not placing the feedlot. It suggests a smaller fed cattle supply in the second half of this year. One thing that's not as positive for prices is these grain markets. Tell us what's been going on there and what that means for beef cattle producers over the next 12 months. Yeah, Kevin's been the big story in the industry, and uh, you know it, it's a uh, it means a lot of things for us. You know, it's been caused it's it's a big crop. It was a big crop last year, but exports, both of corn and soybeans, have been extremely large and tightened up our available supply. So as you work that bet for the cattle prices, you know, starting on the feedlot side, live cattle, initially it's a tough deal because costs go up so fast that people aren't expecting it. It's a shock to the system. It's a little bit of a drag as people try to sell cattle. Longer term, it's considered a bit of a positive because if they do, in theory, feed cattle less corn, shorter period of time, carcass weights come in smaller, it reduces supply of, of beef out there in, in the coming months. Now we look at the other segments, feeder cattle and, and calf prices usually take it on the chin. Mm -hmm. If you're in the feedlot and you're feeding cattle, the first expense you have, of course, is when you buy the animal, and that's your big, biggest expense. After that, the second biggest expense is how much you feed them, how much corn you have to feed them. If those corn prices are higher, that money has to come out of someplace. So it typically comes out of a purchase price. So it will have a negative effect on feeder cattle and calf prices. Hopefully longer term, if fed cattle market can work higher, you'll gain some of that back. But we've seen that in the feeder cattle market here over the last month or two. It's been a struggle when corn went up like it did. 
And certainly it all starts with beef demand. Let's take a step back a minute and just tell us what you see happening relative to the key trends that have been driving beef demand and subsequently cattle prices. Oh, you know, corn's a big story, but demand is a huge story for us, and it's all good. Excellent beef demand, both internationally. We've seen South Korea step up. We've seen China step up in a large way, big player Mexico to some degree. So demand internationally is very strong. Excellent demand for beef here at home as well. People staying home, uh, they're still even in the middle of the winter. Seems like we've been able to move a lot of steak items, grilling steaks, doing it in the oven, something like trimming's been big. Uh, so that's a really good picture for us. We're really friendly on beef supply, or beef demand going forward because we assume in time restaurants will start to reopen and be able to serve more customers. And they're going to have to step back into this beef market to buy uh, the supplies they don't have right now. So going into spring, especially with grilling coming up, restaurants coming back online, we think that uh, beef demand is going to be extremely supportive, extremely good for cattle producers. That's great news. Hopefully people have learned or relearned how to cook beef and how to be successful with it at home. So tell me this, Dwayne, as producers look ahead over the next 12 months, what would be two or three points you would make in terms of the things we can be doing to set ourselves up for the best chance of profitability in 2021? Well, Kevin, as we mentioned, we, we see tighter supplies and better or good beef demand, as good beef demand as we had last year. To us, and what Cattlefax is trying to tell our customers is let's be patient with this market. The market's gonna have a seasonal trend to it, obviously, but we think especially in the second half of this year, Prices of all classes of cattle are going to be higher, maybe substantially higher than they were the same time in 2020. So don't be in a hurry. Of course, we always have to watch your costs. That's not going to go away. We've got to watch this weather. Still dry through a lot of the country. Are we going to get some help with the weather or not? Be prepared for that. But all things equal, be patient selling cattle this year. you got to wait a little bit longer. You don't necessarily take the first bid. Let's wait it out. Let's see how these prices are as we go through the balance of the year. And maybe we can have a great year here in 2021. I sure hope so. Thanks, Dwayne, for your time today. You bet. Thank you. Appreciate being here. Now, for more in-depth information from Cattle Facts, the 2021 Outlook session is going to be part of the Cattle Industry Convention Winter Reboot. That's February 23rd and 24th. It's a completely virtual event, so you can get even more information from the experts at Cattlefax from the comfort of your own home or calving barn. You can get all the details, including how to register, at the website convention.ncba.org. Still ahead on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, you'll learn how Gelvi and Balancer Genetics can add outstanding maternal traits to your herd and meet some ranchers who are raising the breed on their operations. Don't go away, we'll have more right after this. Cattle producers across the country work hard to care for their animals and their land. The USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service is there to help. Find out how you can work with NRCS to develop a conservation plan for your operation. Find possible funding resources for implementing conservation practices or get free expert advice on ways to improve your farm or ranch. Visit the website nrcs.usda.gov today. A profitable cow herd starts with efficient females that can offer longevity and of course produce a strong healthy calf every single year. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Matt Fleck introduces us to two cattle producers in Virginia who are both using Gilvy and Balancer Genetics to help bring maternal power to their operations and their customers. We're a, 
basically a cow-calf operation that focuses on replacement females. Um, we've developed these females over a 25-year period of time. Our operation is a balancer female, bred back to a balancer bull, using outcrosses as far as we can on bloodlines to maintain our heterosis in these cattle. So Tucker Family Farms is a seventh generation family farming operation. In the history of our family, we've been involved in a variety of different commodities. The cattle operation essentially started around 1900 in a meaningful way, and then we're currently working in five breeds. We have three composite lines, two black ones and one red line, and uh, Yelpie is an anchor component of all three of those composites. In Virginia, Bill Tucker's farm is just about 160 miles from the operation owned by Gail Rippey. Though these producers each have different goals, they both saw the value of working to breed maternal function into their herd. And both cattlemen focused on the traits that would result in a cow that best fit their customers' needs. I think everybody's got a different philosophy about how they're going to go about breeding cattle. The mistake that I see a lot of people doing is the first thing that they want, because it's a visual image, is they want to make them as pretty as they possibly can. And while pretty comes with a lot of aesthetic value, oftentimes it comes with sacrifices. Our breeding philosophy years ago, when we got serious about blending breeds to maximize hybrid vigor, we started out focusing on the traits that were most highly heritable first to get those genetics into our population. It's easy to make them pretty once you get the rest of the genetics right. So what we're trying to do is make functional females that our customers can put whatever breed of choice they want on and then take them in the direction that they want to take them in. Our customer base understands moderation in the cow herd understands functional traits. We're not making huge cows, we're making the functional cows. Most beef cow operations look at their steer calf as their premium product and their female as a commodity, being lesser priced or lesser value. I wanted to change that around and make my steer my commodity and my female to be my higher valued animal and be my premium product to sell. By being able to go into the replacement commercial female business and breed these females to do that, we've been able to accomplish that. Um, there's a lot of smaller producers in this area uh, that run anywhere from 30 to 100 cows, and um, they had rather buy a replacement female than to try to keep their own females. Knowing that crossing multiple breeds would help them meet their goals to produce more valuable females, both Bill and Gail added Gelvie and Balancer genetics to their herds. Heterosis is one of the cheapest things that we can do in the beef industry to add value to any operation. I'm not a big fan of straight bred cattle in any aspect. Every breed brings traits to the table. In looking at a female operation, Gelby brings the strongest traits on a female side maternally, the ability to put calves on the ground that'll grow, cows that'll have a lot of longevity in the situation where that we don't have adequate feed and we can't maintain a great body condition score, those cattle will breed right back. They'll give their heart to feed that calf, but then turn around and give us the next calf the next year. So what heterosis is going to do is no matter what breeds we cross, you're going to get increased calf vitality, increased growth components, and an environmental adaptability. Different breeds are going to excel in different traits. There clearly are very specific reasons why we want to make sure that we have Gelfi as, as one of the key components in our composites. So the five breeds we work in, the Gelfi cattle, more than any other breed, bring the traits that are less measurable in the current EPD profiles and yet are so important. The most overlooked trait, in my opinion, in the commercial industry is longevity. And it doesn't matter whether you're buying a car or putting together a factory that we're going to call a cow. If you can amortize that out over 14 or 15 years instead of eight years, look at the return on investment. And our Gelfie cattle are solid. They're, they're the oldest cow in our herds, no matter how we use them in any composite. I think it's really important for producers to try to build consistency in their cow herds and I think both Bill and Gail have been able to do that over the years. They're able to keep track of the sire lines and the cow families that really produce the type of cattle that perform maternally, grow well and also perform on the rail and so then they're able to continue to propagate those genetics generation after generation. For both Bill and Gail, the years of work put into developing a functional set of females has been well received by their customers.
Bill's been using Gelby Genetics since the late 1980s and been uh, building composite cattle since that time. I think he's been focusing on using the maternal strengths of the Gelby breed, but also a balance of traits and the end product is really important. He's also collected a lot of carcass data over the years and so uh, he's able to offer cattle with a complete genetic package to his customers. I sell to a lot of customers that come into this business already in their 50s or their 60s and there are things that they want to do but there's only so many generations they can turn in time and so a big part of what we're ultimately doing in our commercial heifer sales is we're selling them time. We're selling them those five generations that I've already changed and adapted to fit the environment for them so then they can take that work and build on it with their goals without having to start from the beginning. Gail's selecting for a balance of traits when he's selecting his bulls and replacement females, but definitely uh, put a lot more emphasis on the maternal advantage and benefits of Gelvy and Balancer and is capitalizing on that by selling replacement females. If we sell a customer two or three females to go back in their operation, when they need females again, they come back and buy those females. They are very satisfied and very impressed with the performance that these cows can do. Whether they actually go back and put, a balance, put them back on a balancer program or they use a totally different sire back on these cows, these cows work. They work for me, they work for them. From the scenic pasture lands of Southwest Virginia, I'm Matt Fleck, reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Now to learn more about the maternal advantages that Gelve and Balancer Genetics offer, just visit the American Gelve Association's website at gelve.org. Still ahead, we'll take you to Idaho to learn more about the importance of a good parasite management program. So stay with us, we'll be right back. That certain time in the day when you can take a deep breath knowing your work is done. That's the feeling Aspen products can create. Cost-effective alternatives to name brands that deliver the same results. Quillaxin is one of them. Use it to prevent and treat respiratory disease in your herd. Then breathe easy. Find them at Animal Health International. We didn't just design the 6M tractors with you in mind. We designed them with you by our side. The new 6M tractors from John Deere, reimagined by you for you. With improved visibility, better maneuverability, and more ways to customize, so you get everything you need and nothing you don't. Experience the new 6M at your local John Deere dealer. CattleCon 2021 is back in the Music City. Tune in to Tennessee for the cattle industry's biggest convention with education, networking, and fun, not to mention some great tunes. Plus, you can check out the huge NCBA trade show, outstanding entertainment, and much, much more. So make your plans and be there for CattleCon 2021. Stay tuned to convention.ncba.org for all the details. Lice can cause damage to your herd and bottom line, robbing your cattle of valuable nutrition when they need it the most. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Matt Fleck has more on how you can control lice in your cattle herd. With colder weather comes an increased threat of lice infestations in cattle. Dr. Bethany Patterson, a veterinarian practicing out of Hagerman, Idaho, knows firsthand the challenges lice can cause to cattle and the impact to a producer's bottom line. Lice make cattle extremely pruritic or itchy, um, and that is a source of irritation, which their irritation in and of itself is associated with decreased weight gains. The irritation also causes them to rub a lot, and so that causes them to lose hair and also could potentially cause damage to facilities or equipment. So lice is definitely a cool season pest. Typically, um, the irritation and rubbing would be some of the first signs that producers see. Hair loss can be seen on the neck, the top line, and around the tail head typically. Lice is definitely contagious. They can spread very rapidly. Um, certain types of lice don't even, or can reproduce asexually, and so, um, 
it's definitely a problem, and if not taken care of, can get out of control pretty fast. In southern Idaho, the Anderson family has a long tradition of exceptional care and attention to the health of their Hereford cattle, starting when their operation was founded. We started with my mom and dad. They started a seed stock operation when my dad bought three bred Hereford heifers for my mom for an anniversary present. In 1986, I met my husband, and uh, we were married in 1987. He was not raised on a ranch. He was a meat cutter. He knew what the inside of a cow was supposed to look like, so he got to learn a little bit more about what the outside of a cow should look like. We are primarily a registered Hereford seed stock operation. We sell two-year-old bulls, yearling bulls, both Hereford and Red Angus, replacement heifers. Our son, Brian, works on the ranch with us, and he has a herd of cattle, and our daughter, uh, who is a student at Utah State, she also has a herd of cattle. So we are a third generation operation. We want to have the best environment for our animals to perform the best they possibly can. With lice, we know that they like the chillier weather. We all kind of take on that responsibility of looking through the herd and the first signs of uh, lice infestation. Uh, we, we work to make sure that we get them properly treated. Herd health program is very important. It's strongly believe in it. Them cattle are uncomfortable and I, it's just good to get them treated. They're gonna, they're gonna gain weight better. They just look better. They're not just driving themselves crazy trying to scratch an itch. <laughs> Even though producers may think of lice as more of a cool climate problem, the issue can cause problems and performance losses in any part of the country. Here in Idaho, it's the perfect environment for lice. It's cold, um, their reproductive life cycle can take as little as three weeks. In other parts of the country, it's a little bit warmer and their life cycle may be prolonged, um, but they can still be a problem and why every producer needs to be concerned about lice in their herd. It's really important due to the economic losses. Cattle that aren't happy aren't eating they're losing weight. Um, it's an extremely contagious parasite, and so if you don't get control of it early on, it can wreak havoc in your herd. And then one single louse can turn into a million in just a few short months. So not getting that infection or infestation under control early can lead to a really massive problem in a, in a herd over time. Fortunately, there are options for producers to use in treating lice and getting ahead of a serious problem. Treating lice, the actual louse, is not necessarily hard, um, but the problem comes in with an infestation. And so what producers need to know, I kind of group them into three buckets, um, the timing, the administration, and then the individual animal. As far as timing, you have to make sure you do this not too early in the season, but not too late to where the infestation has taken over your herd. Um, administration is really, really important. You need to make sure that you're administering the right dose, not underdosing, and applying according to the label. Some products require administration down the pole along the entire back line to make sure the full animal is covered. And then finally, as far as the individual animal, each and every single animal needs to be treated in your herd and also any direct contact animals. So missing one, again, can turn into an infestation of a million in just a few short months. Cleanup 2 is a product that has an insect growth regulator and that will take care of both stages all at one time. So those that have used Cleanup 2, um, they've noticed that they have not had to retreat the animals that they some years in previous would have to retreat. Um, so you're saving on that time, stress, labor of working those cattle again through the chute. A good relationship with a veterinarian is really important and you can have the veterinarian out to try to identify and even speciate what kind of lice you're dealing with and then what product you should go to and help you develop a treatment regimen to get that infestation under control as rapidly as possible. Cleanup 2 gives producers a weapon in the fight against lice and one that's easy to use. An advantage to using Cleanup 2 is that it has a maximum volume administered, so you don't necessarily have to get the exact weight of each animal. A maximum of 30 mLs for a thousand pound or above animal, otherwise it's three mLs per hundred weight. For one, you know, if the lice treatment is working, you don't have cattle with them bald spots, they're, they're easier to sell. I mean, it can mean $500 more a bull. 
James and Dawn Anderson make their living on the land, giving the best possible care for their cattle. The reason that James and I chose to, to come back onto the farm is there is no better way to raise children. And it's proven to be uh, very profitable emotionally as well as physically. And that's the reason that we, we look at different ways of taking care of our cattle and, and being more efficient in what we do um, is because it's, it's not just important to us, it's important way beyond us. In Idaho, I'm Matt Fleck, reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. For more information about lice management techniques and how Cleanup 2 can help, visit elancolivestock.com. Up next, the always entertaining Baxter Black, so stay with us. Weeds will rob me of my investments. The weeds are not palatable to the cows. They will not eat them. Or if they do eat them, some of them may be toxic. So there's a return on investment by allowing there to be more grass available to be grazed by the cattle. Did you know that Prefert makes over a thousand different farm, ranch, and rodeo items? And now, thanks to Prefert Direct, it's easier than ever before to get access to every item Prefert makes delivered direct to your local dealer. For more information about Prefert Direct, visit us at prefert.com. Prefert, America's number one name in farm, ranch, and rodeo. Out of the box for the Rewrite Side of Rodeo. Three audio books, rodeo novels by Baxter Black. A total of 23 hours following our cowboy guys and gals on the road to the finals. Rambunctious, exciting, kind-hearted, and funny, of course, $39.90. CDs or downloads, BaxterBlack.com, 800-654-2550. On the road to the rodeo, horse show, state fair, ball game, or grandma's house, climb on up and take a ride with me. We were down at the Smith barn one day, cabin first calf heifers. Dale was the boss, and to give you an idea what kind of guy Dale was, Pancho named him El Gallo con Espuelas, which means the rooster with spurs. And he does kind of walk with his chest stuck out and sort of cocky and wears them big old jingling rowls, always wearing a bright scarf. Well, he came a-striding in down there one morning pretty early, just dressed up fit to kill. Brand new shirt and everything, I mean, he was really proud. Well, George had been there all night, and he had a heifer in a squeeze shoe trying to pull this calf, and he'd pulled for all he was worth, and he was plumb give out. Well, Dale saw him and said, What's the matter with you? Can't you pull this calf? Get out of the way and let me do it. Well, George wasn't about to argue. He'd been working all night a heifer for a long time anyway. Well, Dale stepped around there behind the heifer, propped his feet up against the bottom of the squeeze chute, grabbed a hold of them two old bee handles and just reared back. Well, that calf was coming straight out. And he had his head just right, and he's a big old calf. And Dale, whenever he gets to doing something, he grits his teeth and smiles just like a jack-o'-lantern and squints his eyes. He had a good grip, and I mean, he was leaned back like a water skier. As the calf started to come, a nice smooth round little forehead on the calf pressed up on the heifer's rectum and cleaned it slicker than a whistle. There was a stream about an eighth of an inch wide and two inches thick that came arcing out like a rainbow. It just missed the brim of his hat and splattered all over his face, in his mouth, down the front of his shirt, and he couldn't do nothing because he was reared back so far. If he'd let go, he'd have fell flat on his back. So he just hung on till the calf came out and crashed in a soggy pile on top of him. Dale came to life. <clears throat> He was spitting in the cousin, and he raised his head just in time, pretty as you please, to see that heifer clean her afterbirth right in his lap. This is Baxter Black from under there. 
We want to remind you to mark your calendars for the 2021 Cattle Industry Convention Winter Reboot. It's a completely virtual event from February 23rd through the 24th that you can take part in right from the convenience of your farmer ranch. We're talking about two days of cattle industry news, updates, and valuable producer education. You can get all the details, including how to register at the website convention.ncba.org. Well, we're wrapping up this week's show with legacy photos. Of course, these are great shots submitted by our viewers. So let's take a look. Want to see your photo on Cattleman to Cattleman? Well, you can submit your favorite shots a couple of ways. Message them to us on the Cattleman to Cattleman Facebook page or email them to c2c at beef.org. Send them our way and we may just use them on a future episode. Well, that wraps up this edition of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. Thank you so much for spending time with us again. And we'll see you again next week right here on RFD TV.